Hi, so today we've got another flight recorder. Now this one's quite a bit smaller than the one I did a while ago, which is here. And um, judging by the size, I suspect this is probably a solid state one. So um, let's get in there and take a look. Now uh, this came from eBay and like somebody has been inside before me. The warranty seal was broken when I got it. Um, I'm using this sort of fairly big brackets with these um, push down bayonet retaining trouble things. Uh, at the end there's a few connectors, some of these are blank so these two don't actually have any pins on them so and also there's actually this connector, I'm not sure if that's an RF connector or fibre or uh, even a, a pneumatic thing but that's actually just a dummy, there's nothing at all inside that so I don't know if that's to park a cable that's unused by this or whether this is just a standard form factor that always has these connectors, I'm not quite sure why they'd fit that rather than um, just not you're not fitting anything at all. There's three connectors that are actually, actually populated, so there's quite a large number of pins on these sort of really standard military style connectors. Another one here and another one here that's got some uh, look like either coax or possibly even triax connectors. There. Uh, nothing on any of the other sides. The um, underwater locator beacon was missing from this. But the fact the brackets were there suggests it probably was on here at some point, but um, that was taken off before uh, it got to me. And this is manufactured by Penny and Giles in the UK. Can't find any signs of any date at the moment. Um, so it's got the standard orange casing with some reflective tape. This reflective tape, so if someone's looking for it, the idea is it will uh, shine up and be more obvious in a crash site. Um, so I don't know, no idea what this is intended for. So it's a smaller package than the other ones. I don't know if this is a new sort of standard mount for flight recorders or this was from something different than a standard commercial aircraft. Um, I really don't know. I haven't found anything at all online. The, the interesting thing is it does have an NSM which stands for NATO stock number. So that suggests to me it may actually be aimed at military rather than um, civilian use. Don't know whether um, sort of civilian flight recorders have these or not, but um, that's what tends to suggest it's a military uh, type of thing. Quite a lot of electronics in here. This is a um, sort of flex rigid PCB assembly, so there's a sort of flex that's laminated into the main PCB to provide connections to these uh, two sideboards. Um, in here, you can see the little um, toroidal tra main transformer. And like most um, aircraft stuff, this runs on 115 volts at 400 hertz. Because it's 400 hertz, they don't need as much iron in the transformer, so that's why it's a tiny little transformer. Some smoothing caps up there. It looks like a power supply board. There's a couple of uh, ferrite cord transformers in there, so that's probably a DC 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 converter. Probably various power supply rails. There's a sort of subboard on top of here, which has got a wind wind river license. So that may be a sort of complete processor board, or just a memory board with the um, operating system and software on it. And connected to a flex down here, which goes into this. So this is clearly where the actual data is stored. I say I think this is probably solid state. It's and it's possible it could be a hard disk. This cylindrical shape probably just for strength. Because obviously this is where all the data is stored. So this is probably going to be filled with sort of fire resistant stuff to protect uh, whatever's inside here holding the actual data. So I've managed to find a couple of date codes. The most recent date codes I've found uh, on some of the chips are 2006. So this thing's only about 10 years old. So sort of relatively recent in terms of um, aircraft equipment and uh, almost certainly um, probably still, still a current model flying in uh, whatever it was uh, originally meant to fly in. Um, this board's got a very heavy sort of conformal coating on it for uh, environmental protection. There's a sort of multi-way, all the cables come in on this uh, multi-way connector down there. So let's take this end assembly off and uh, have a look. So I've got the um, cabling. Now interesting, the, um, there's this bulkhead which has got feed-through capacitors and filters only to one of the connectors, the other ones go directly, so I wonder if maybe this connector is the one that goes to the normal aircraft systems and this top one is maybe only used for maintenance and readout and then there's this, there's this bus one, this might have some, this is probably um, sort of data bus 
So there's some quite substantial filtering there. So there's some, well, I'm guessing some ferrite filters that are marked F, whereas these are just feed through caps, just marked with C. So we've got the uh, the incoming main supply goes through those filters. There's one wire that actually sort of comes out of that section back to this this side connector. That could just be auxiliary power, so maybe this can either be powered sort of from the aircraft or when you perhaps plug a maintenance connector, the thing can be powered from that. And these all go onto these, uh, I'm guessing these, I'm sure these are shielded cables down to this uh, single connector. And the other lead to the main transformer. 115 volt, 400 hertz transformer, not strictly mains. Well, I've just traced it and metered some of these wires, so the um, the output of the main transformer goes to this bridge rectifier. And there's, there's this additional diode going to the same place as the output of the rectifier, and this does come from this extra pair. So it clearly is that sort of it can run on a, a main supply from this connector or a DC supply from this other connector. So um, I think we should probably try and power this up and see what happens. There are a few LEDs on the board, so at least we might get some LEDs lighting up. Now I'm sure I don't know what voltage this takes, DC voltage in the stated, um, I haven't got 115 volt, 400 volt supply, so I'm going to do, just to get a rough idea, is I'm just going to put a 20th of the input voltage, sort of 5.75 volts at 400 hertz, from a signal generator into the transformer primary, and measure the secondary voltage. So that's about 1.1 1, 1 .1 volts, so that's probably going to be sort of about a bit over 20, 22 volts. RMS coming out of here, so I know the 28 volts is quite a common voltage used in aircraft, so I'm going to guess the um, DC supply for this should be 28 volts, so um, let's try sticking 28 volts DC on that DC input and see what happens. Right, there's a few LEDs on this board, so let's see if anything happens when you turn this on. Yep, there's a little click there, I'm not sure if that was a relay or something else. It's drawing about 300 milliamps. You can hear a slight buzz from some DC-DC converters. LED's just gone out. Thing, uh, too exciting. Just try power cycling it again. Yeah, there is a. It sounds like a relay. There is actually um, a metal can relay here, so I was just, just guessing it's that. Just put your finger on it so you can feel it. No, I can't feel that, but there might be. Um, it sounds a bit noisy to be a metal can relay, but there may well be another relay buried in here that we uh, haven't found yet. Now we've got a very interesting looking chip on this board is this is it says a DDC Mini Ace. Now this is a um a multi-chip module that implements the uh, MIL standard 1553 bus. This is a sort of serial bus used for military and I think commercial aviation electronics. It's sort of mid-speed serial bus, sort of like the aircraft equivalent to CAN bus. It, it supports things like redundancy. So for example here there's actually two two bus connections here, so this is probably a dual redundant um system. Right, so this is the electronics assembly. Um, I had quite a long poke around to see if I could find any sort of UART data streams or anything, but I couldn't see anything um, that looked particularly interesting. I think it's quite surprising is this power um, board seems to be not putting out quite a lot of crap. There's a sort of quite high frequency uh, fuzz on a lot of signals made it quite hard to actually see what was going on, but I couldn't immediately see anything that looked like um, UART data. So we've got these uh, nice High quality turn pin connectors, not surprisingly. And so it's a flex rigid assembly, so uh, the board's board is connected by this uh, layer that's laminated up to the uh, main PCBs. So here, this is, the, this is that Mill um, Standard 1553 transceiver. This is what handles the um, low level stuff as well as I think some of the high level protocol. Because obviously, if you're talking to an aircraft bus, you don't really want to roll, roll your own. Um, comms engine, you sort of just want to buy that off the shelf, have something that's really tested and approved and proven. You don't really want to be sort of doing anything nasty to a, your plane's communication bus. Interesting, it's actually got a serial number on the chip, which you don't see very often. And also some bodge wires, quite a lot of bodges. Although at least these are all sort of very neatly done and tacked down. There's one or two on the, um, another one down there. Metal can relay there. I'm guessing that may be to physically disconnect it from the bus when it's not powered up, perhaps. Um, there's an Altera Flex FPGA here and its configuration memory down here. That I think it's four thirty. I think it's a TMS four thirty um, processor there. Just a few old random little bits on the top. Nothing much on the inside of the top top of the uh, back of this one. 
this is the main processor. This is um, a Motorola sort of PAL PC based system on a chip. And a TIDSP, interestingly, um, there's also a, um, a programmable filter chip here, which is uh, doesn't seem to be near anything else analog, which is a bit interesting. Not quite sure what that's going to be about. But the um, so there's a TIDSP. I don't know whether that's to do with perhaps data compression, or maybe um, this thing does voice recording. Perhaps there's an audio feed in there. I haven't spotted any ADCs there. There's um, an Ethernet transceiver chip there and transformer so um, I wonder if maybe that's the um, the external interfaces by Ethernet through that connector. I haven't traced these pins but I would imagine that's probably what it is. Some big sort of bass transceivers here. So there's not a huge number of tracks going over the um, flex rigid connections. And this plug-in board here this this has got the uh, ROM and uh, RAM on it. So obviously they could change that if they needed different uh, memory capacities. But so there's uh, four flash ROMs there with um, the software in it, and um, a couple of RAMs, another RAM chip, it might be a cache or something on there. So we've got the Altera PGA. Right, so uh, let's see if we can get into this thing. Um, I've undone some of the bolts. These bolts, I think they've been thread locked in. Um, I had to use an impact driver to loosen most of these, and some of these are actually chewed before I managed to get them off. But let's see if we can uh, go in this end. Looks like there's, I'm guessing there's probably going to be some sort of filling or potting compound in here. Probably some thermal insulation. This feels like a fairly substantial lump of what looks like stainless. I'll take all these out. I think this end plate might just still be stuck on with sort of the, the compound. Feels like a sort of fairly th lightweight material, some sort of foam, and then there's something around the outside. Yeah, I think hopefully we should be able to dig that out. I think this is going to start getting messy. Let's get some containment. And this is obviously the uh, fireproof uh, insulation. Now, I don't expect this to be too ridiculously hard to get out because obviously if this had a suffered some catastrophic uh, damage in a crash they'd actually want to be able to get out the um, stuff inside without risking destroying it so uh, I just feel there is something fairly solid inside there so there's probably a secondary container Right, so this is what's inside. Um, there's a few little handwritten things on the side. Can't read that much. Issue something rather batch number. And there's a date, 3rd of October 2007. Surprised it's not sort of more sort of formally printed, engraved, just handwritten, something like this. Um, it's got some potting compound. It's not sort of rock hard, so it might be diggable through but it's also there's some sort of soft material so I'm guessing the PCB is probably coated in soft material and then potted so the soft material absolutely yeah, prevents the hard potting um, causing damage so. yeah so it looks like it's a two stage there's definitely some rubbery stuff and some uh, harder material I think I might actually uh, Try and cut this uh, can off. Might make it a bit easier to uh, get the bulk of the potting off. Feels like some little glass balls falling out of this. Let's uh, can catch these. Yeah, there's sort of sand, but it feels like they're sort of quite circular, circular particles. Sort of very reflective. So I wonder if these are the same things they use for sort of reflective road signs. Oh, 
it seems to be filled with this uh, stuff. Again, I presume this is a very high thermal insulative material. Looks like there's an additional um, metal can in here. Oh, here you go. Yes, yeah, so there's an extra metal can, and the inner can is actually the inner. The inside of the can is filled with this uh, powdery stuff. Yeah, so that rubbery stuff, this is just really protecting the flex passing through the, uh, the lid of this can. It's just a slot in here that it's been passed through. Right, so it looks like there's a few levels of protection. We've got the outermost can, we've got all that grey sort of uh, plastery stuff. Then um, in the can, this sort of potting compound. Next, slightly thicker sort of stainless tube, and then that was filled with this. Um, these are like sort of little tiny little glass beads. So this is the actual uh, memory module. Seems to be uh, four of these sort of dip modules by um, M Systems. These are sort of uh, it's called Discon Chip 2000. So these are sort of um, flash with a flash controller on there. They've also got some of these temperature sensitive labels to show how hot it's got. So I'm sure if we uh, just give this some heat we'll see these change colour. Yeah, so they go black over a certain temperature. There's different labels showing different temperatures to get some idea of how hot this thing's got internally. There is also some other stuff underneath these modules. Let's uh, pull this apart a bit. And this is a flex rigid assembly and they're just using these bits of PCB to uh, provide a bit of uh, additional structure. All right, so in addition to the um, those memory um, disk on chip modules we've also got some flash on the main PCB. Bit curious as to why they'd use two different types of memory you know if they were just going for density um, I would have thought they could just put their own module on top of it rather than using these sort of off-the-shelf modules. Looks like there's probably flash on the other side of that as well. So each of these four modules provides um, 96 megabytes so there's 384 megabytes of storage on these. And then these are only two megabytes each, so I um, don't know if maybe these are storing maybe additional data, error correction, or indexing data, or what, I don't know, but it seems a bit odd why they'd put that extra little bit of memory uh, on like that. It doesn't seem worth it in terms of actual memory capacity, there's probably some other usage, uh, some other use for it. Well, I traced out the um, pins from the Ethernet connector to the uh, back panel, and that does indeed go to the additional connector with the DC input. So clearly, it uses Ethernet to get the data out, which would make a lot of sense uh, from the uh, the speed point of view. So, being a fairly modern piece of kit, 10 years old, um, Ethernet is obviously a fairly common interface. Um, I have hooked it up and tried doing some um, very simple things. Uh, it doesn't attempt to get an address from my router. I've done some ARP scans on some sort of few address ranges but I can't get any response but um, you do actually get some lead flashes in response to the um, ethernet traffic on these leads here so we get so when the links up you get the, the left to um, light up when it's connected no, that flash I think is my laptop um, just trying to talk to the world because I've just connected it straight through a um, crossover adapter here so um, it is clearly listening on Ethernet, but um, without knowing sort of the IP address or any anything else, it's pretty not great, not very useful. But um, I'm going to leave this in reasonably working state for the moment, just in case anyone does have any information on sort of you know, what the IP address typically is on these things, or if they've got access to the software for reading these out. It might be quite interesting to uh, see what's in this thing. And again, the um, the memory module. I've actually chopped one of the one of these dip modules out but I could resolve that and get this all sort of back together and working so uh, I'm going to leave it in that state for the moment and uh, see if I can find any, any more information out of it so uh, and again the I'm not going to crack open this chip just yet so we found that I found that picture from the website that gives a reasonable information about the information over um, what it does but so for the moment so I'll leave this in a state that it can be powered up in and um, see if anyone can give any more information about it.